you so much and uh, good evening uh, everyone uh, am i audible or is, is it clear yes yeah, yes, yeah sir. fine okay so after a good history uh, the student should be able to uh, come to a conclusion whether it's his, this patient has got a stable spine or an unstable spine is there a, a neurological deficit partial or complete and of course which part of the spine is involved cervical thoracic or lumbar depending upon uh, whether the spine is stable or not and deficit or not the, the examination should be done whether only in lying down position because sometimes if it's an unstable whether neurological uh, progress uh, progressive neuro neurological deficit can occur then we would not like to examine the spine either in the standing sitting or perform movements or even examine the gait so having said that right in the beginning we start with the uh, general physical examination and it is important not just for the sake of saying no picturesque spinal cyanosis but pallor could be seen for example in a metastatic spine some blood loss uh, going on uh, because of uh, let's say a gi malignancy where there is a history of a melina so a history in history also we should try to find out the cause of the primary Pectoris, for example, could be seen where a patient on anti-tubercular therapy uh, could develop pectoris, lymphadenopathy, matted lymph node could be seen in tuberculosis, or Hodgkin's can sometimes present with the spinal involvement. Caffeolus spots, I'll talk about it later. And just expansion, whether you talk right in the beginning, the general physical, or in the uh, uh, as a part of the measurements, it should be done in the fourth intercostal space to rule out ankylos and spondylitis. Now, a head-to-toe -to examination, I've made this slide for the postgraduates so that nothing is missed, especially in case of metastasis, if you try to find out what, what could be the uh, site of the primary, whether on the history or on examination. So if you follow from head-to-toe, -to neck, for example, thyroid malignancy, and the history could be a history of uh, hypo or hyperthyroidism, and on examination, there could be a, um, a mass in the neck, a breast examination, even in the males, one should try to examine the uh, breast, the respiratory system, the abdomen, especially looking for any organomegaly for the metastasis, look, trying to assess for any SOAS abscess and tuberculosis, and also uh, examining for the, uh, any enlarged size of the kidney or prostate or cervix. Usually we do not examine for vaginal examination, but you can always tell the exam that uh, we, have, we have not done it, so that examiner knows that it should have been done. And uh, in the tuberculosis, of course, looking for sites of cold abscesses. And uh, uh, I'll talk about cold abscess in the latest slides. So, and the uh, general physical examination, a cafe or a spot for the postgraduates, uh, uh, very, can you see the cursor on the uh, slide? Is my cursor visible? Yes, yes sir, it is visible, visible. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, so yes, you can see smooth margins of a cafe or a spots, like the smooth margins of the beaches of California. So that is uh, in neurofibromatosis compared to the ragged margins, okay, we've seen in the coast of Maine. Maine is in the, this part of uh, US near Boston, where it's rocky, uh, uh, the uh, land is rocky. Uh, and uh, this is seen in fibrous dysplasia polyostotic. So spine examination, we have to do uh, just like any other uh, region, inspection, palpation, movements, measurements, special tests. And gait. So, in the inspection, you should look for telltale spine, the spina bifida occulta, the attitude, uh, the deformities, cold abscess, and muscle spasms, of which I'll talk a little bit in more detail in the subsequent slides. However, I would like to close these matter here, especially looking for scars and sinuses, whether they're active or healed, looking for pressure sores, wet sores, and what grade of pressure sores it is. And often the candidate uh, forgets to men mention whether the patient has got an indwelling Foley scapula. So after the inspection, uh, during the inspection, let me go to the telltale signs of spina bifida occulta. You must look for not only tuft of hair in the lumbar spine, but even it could be in the thoracic or in the cervical spine. So exposure of the back is important. Look for lipomas, look for any dimpling of the skin, and uh, for the attitude in the cervical spine, for example, if it is an active disease of tuberculosis, a child may present with a torticollis or a rust sign like holding the head and neck supporting the head with his hands. In the thoracic spine, a spasm in the thoracic spine could re, uh, give rise to a squaring of shoulders, sort of an attitude, like a military attitude. And in the lumbar spine, we have the alderman gait because of the spasm in the lumbar spine. 
the patient is walking like an older man. Older men are basically a term used in the US or uh, Western countries who are the city councillors. So they are walking as if you know they are. Uh, so the after inspection, we come to palpation. Of course, always palpation starts with local temperature and the tenderness. I'll talk about this in the next few slides. And the deformity, kyphosis, scoliosis, or is it a kyphoscoliosis? And I'll talk in details about world abscess later. So palpation, one should check for direct tenderness by palpating the spinous process. However, it is very important, especially in tuberculosis of the spine, where there's a paradiscal involvement, to give an indirect push on from one side of the spinous process, thereby rotating the spinous process and uh, thereby eliciting pain if the disease is the anterior part of the spine. And you can see that in this uh, next slide, the same patient with the kyphotic deformity, there was no muscle spasm, but at the time of eliciting the tenderness, a muscle spasm appeared. So this can occur in an active disease of tuberculosis. It's very important for the postgraduate to mark the spinous processes, especially with a uh, good skin marking pen, so that the examiner knows that he has uh, done this exercise. And one can uh, identify the vertebral level either from proximal to distal. Uh, from the proximal, the first spinous prominence spinous process is seven, known as the vertebra prominence. However, uh, the T1, thoracic one, is more prominent than C7. So sometimes one can miss the C7 and think that the T1 is the C7. So you have to be careful about it. The landmarks of the scapula, the spinous process at T3 and the inferior angle of scapula at T7 are important. But since scapula is a mobile structure, it's very important that the patient while examining should have the limbs by the side and not move. Uh, if the uh, upper limb is abducted, then there could be a false uh, leveling because of the movement of the scapula. So the distal part, a very good landmark, is the highest point of the iliac crest, which corresponds to the L4 vertebral body. Regarding the deformity, the postgraduate should be able to tell whether it's a knuckle, the single vertebral involvement, or angular two to three, or rounded. A uh, single vertebral involvement is, could be seen in a eosinophilic granuloma. Metastasis can have single, angular, or rounded anything. Uh, lymphoma usually occurs in single. A central type of tuberculosis, which is quite rare, can cause knuckle deformity. More commonly, tuberculosis causes two to three vertebral involvements and angular deformity. Uh, metastasis can also have the same thing. And rounded can be seen in Sherman's disease or a senile kyphosis uh, because of old age. Deformity uh, of scoliosis, one should be able to know whether it's a postural scoliosis and whether it's just a scoliosis or is it a sciatic list. And the scoliosis is structural or it's non-structural. Various causes of structural scoliosis are there. And one very easy method of uh, differentiating is ask the patient to bend forward as if to touch the front of his uh, uh, foot and ankle. So if it's a, a non-structural scoliosis, then the uh, spine deformity will disappear. If it's a structural scoliosis, the deformity will persist. Uh, one can also do this while making the patient lie prone. If it's a young child, very small, then even the child can be lifted by the chin just like in the rust sign, that, that sort of a support. And if it's a non-structural, the spine straightens out. That's only for a very, very young child. For the cold abscesses, a very important for the post is to know in the cervical spine, it can present anywhere in the uh, triangles of the neck. In the thoracic spine, it can go. Uh, so what is cold abscess? Cold abscess is basically all the, uh, not the uh, debris from the tubercular uh, spine, uh, which is more common in the paradiscal, as I said before, and all the granulation tissue and the debris and the pus, which tracks down along the lines of least resistance. So it may gravitate down or it can follow uh, the ne neurovascular bundle or the interfacial planes. So it can follow uh, the nerve root and go in the paravertebral area. It can follow the intercostal nerve root and go along uh, between the two ribs till the middle or the anterior uh, axillary fold. It can even follow anteriorly in the anterior chest wall. And a very uh, favorite question uh, to the postgraduates is, uh, 
whether a psoas abscess can be, uh, you know, uh, can occur in a patient with a high like uh, T5 or T6 tuberculosis. So for that, we have to understand the anatomy. The prevertebral fascia is attached to the T4. So all the abscesses due to a cervical spine tuberculosis is limited to the up to T4 itself. But T4 downwards, the abscess may crack, gravitate along the aorta, and through the openings of the diaphragm could go into any of the uh, regions I'm going to talk about. So one by one, along the lateral arcuate ligament, this is the lateral arcuate ligament, it can come along the quadratus lumborum, it can go behind the kidney, it can go from there along the 12th thoracic or the ilioinguinal or iliohypogastric nerve onto the anterior abdominal wall, it can go along the medial ar lumbocostal arch or medial arcuate ligament to the psoas sheet and go down as a psoas abscess. It can go along the median arcuate ligament, which crosses the aorta, and along the aorta, it can go into the abdomen uh, along any of its branch. So it can go from uh, the internal pudendal artery, even up to the ischiorectal fossa. It can follow the superior gluteal artery to the buttocks. I remember uh, two, three months back, a patient came to our orthopedic ward from, referred from surgery, because there was an abscess in the buttocks and they had done an IND and later it turned to be a cold abscess from the spine. So the uh, cold abscess can go along the sheet of the psoas or quadratus lumborum. It can follow the lumbar nerves. It can go up to the femoral and obturator nerve into the thigh. It can go on the back. It can go to, from the sciatic nerve. Theoretically, it can go even as far as the popliteal fossa or even follow the uh, nerves in the toes, though I have not seen one under the toe. Intermuscular plane, the petite striangle is another favorite question we asked. The, uh, so this is the psoas abscess. And for the triangles, there are two important triangles for the students to know. One is the superior lumbar triangle, which is bounded by the T12. And then you have the internal oblique here. And then the quadratus lumborum. And for the petite triangle, this is the iliac crest, the latissimus dorsi, and the external oblique. So these two areas from the interfacial planes a cold abscess may track down and one must look for them during the palpation. So different sites of cold abscesses could be there. Regarding movements, as I mentioned before, you must uh, tell the examiner if the patient has got an unstable spine or a neurological deficit that you, were, you have not done the movements and would not like to do the movements. However, in an unstable spine, if it's a cervical spine pathology, uh, if it's a stable spine, then you can do the movements various movements of the spine, cervical spine, various movements of the lumbar spine. Here I would like to highlight about the thoracic spine. That in the thoracic spine, the most important movement is the rotation because the other movements are restricted because of the rib cage and the rotation which can be observed by making the patient uh, sit on a stool or a chair and rotating from the right or left, the patient will have pain. So that could give a clue that it's a thoracic spine uh, a pathology like a uh, uh, tuberculosis of the thoracic spine, which is uh, anteriorly paradiscal but creating a pain on movement, rotatory movements. Regarding the measurements, various measurements are there for uh, the ankylosing spondylitis to know the excursion of the spine movement, the Schober's test, and the modified Schober's test, various books uh, describe it differently. So basically, it is when you lie, draw a line along the limple of the venous and uh, take up to 10 centimeter proximal or the modified of uh, 15 centimeter and ask the patient to bend forwards. There should be an excursion of 5 centimeter during the normal movement of the lumbar spine. Whereas if there is a restriction of the movement, it will be less than 5 centimeter. The other movements, which is very important, especially for uh, recording the progress of a disease of ankylosing spondylitis, uh, could be the chin brow, the vertical angle, which uh, normally should be zero degree, but in a, a patient with a kyphosis, it would be progressive in ankylosing spondylitis. Similarly, a normal person, the occiput should be able to uh, touch the wall behind, but if there is a deformity and progressive, then this uh, ball test would be positive, head occipital, the occipital ball uh, distance would increase. Similarly, the distance between the tip of the fingers and the floor from the front or from the side could give an assessment of the amount of restriction of the spinal uh, movements forward or lateral flexion. Regarding the gait, Dr. Kapoor would be talking about gait. However, I'd like to talk a few things here. One is the uh, 
simian stance. Okay, so the simian stance is seen, uh, simian is ape like, so that is a forward stance which is seen in lumbar canal stenosis. And uh, the other thing I would like to talk about is the sciatic disc. So, uh, usually the disc is, uh, you know, the uh, uh, it's not a far lateral disc, okay. So the axillary presentation of the disc, if, if it's uh, irritating the nerve root, the patient will turn away so that it gets relaxed. Whereas if it's a shoulder presentation, which is irritating near the shoulder, right? The, uh, uh, sorry, I said it the other way around. So if it's an axillary presentation here, the patient will turn on the same side so that the nerve root gets relaxed. If it's a shoulder presentation, then the person will turn the opposite side to relax the nerve root. Uh, Special tests uh, are there for the disc prolapse and the SI joints, and quickly I'll go through them. The Lasix test, also known as the straight leg raising test, is by raising the lower limb one by one. It's important to raise on the side where the neurological symptoms of uh, radiation, radicular pain is there. So if you raise the limb on that side, between 30 to 70 degrees, it is positive to show a positive SLR. And this is not the correct way of the Lasix test where you flex the hip and knee and then extend. However, some literature do mention about it, but we generally talk about this way. And uh, when we perform the Lasix test, it's important it should not be just a back pain, it should be a radiating pain along the nerve root. And uh, the sensitivity of this test is 91, but specificity is better if it's a cross uh, SLR where the patient may be complaining of pain radiating on one limb, but on raising the opposite limb, there is a uh, pain. So that is seen in a large disc, a central type of disc. Then we have the Bragard's test. So in the SLR test, we just lift the limb and where the pain has uh, appeared, you can just uh, flex the knee a little. Whereas in the Bragard's test, we dorsiflex the, at the point where the uh, SLR was positive, you decrease the, you bring down the limb a little and then dorsiflex the uh, ankle. So that would again stress the nerve root and cause the pain. Then the bowstring stretch, uh, test where after doing the SLR, you bring down the limb a little and then press on to the lateral popliteal nerve and that will cause increase in pain. So these are the special nerve root stretch tests in case of PIVD. Uh, for the femoral uh, nerve stretch test, you need to keep the patient prone. This is more important for uh, the disc prolapse, which is rarer in the L23 and L34. Uh, so classically, the SLRT was uh, described for the L5-S1, um, and this is known as the reverse plastic test. Test for SI joint, the various tests, let's look at them one by one. The flexion, abduction, and external rotation of the Patrick's test is by stabilizing the pelvis on one side and doing the flexion, abduction, external rotation. Then we have the Gans lens test, where we, again, we flex the opposite side and the side to be tested we get the patient to the side of the examination couch and take the limb off the couch and do a an hyperextension of the hip. So that would cause a pain at the SI joint. And then some, some, some uh, examiners also like to know about the pump handle test where we take the, uh, flex the hip and knee and take it towards the shoulder and that would cause pain. So I think, yeah, so that's about the um, uh, presentation. I tried to do it in 12 minutes. I hope uh, not to exceed much time.